Thank you for joining everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to join in and then Ian will start the webinar. Hello everyone, we'll be starting in the next one minute, just waiting for everyone waiting in the lobby to join, and then Ian will start the webinar. I think we're good to start now. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time out to join us for this very special webinar with our very special BenQ ambassador, Ian Vanderbold. Uh, my name is Aditya, I'm from BenQ's marketing team. And today I'll be the host uh, of the evening and Ian will be presenting the webinar in which he'll be talking about his color managed workflow and uh, would be uh, going through his color settings and everything in regards to making uh, he, putting his accumulative ex year, uh, experience of 35 years together and, and uh, helping you guys out where he can. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, so please wait for uh, the turn of Q&As, but you can, you're still very welcome to uh, input your questions in the chat box. Uh, I'll hand it over to Ian now, and we'll start from there. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in with us tonight. Um, my presentation today is really a fairly basic presentation to try and get across the simple um, steps that we need to follow to ensure that we have accurate or predictable colour from uh, capturing with our camera right through to uh, to printing. We're not going to get into printing tonight, but there's just a few simple steps that if we follow those, we, we will be able to predict uh, the sort of colour that we're going to get. I'm just going to quickly change cameras for a moment. 
uh, and just I am currently uh, just set up in my studio downstairs. I'm plugged into a um, a MacBook Pro. I've got the 27 inch BenQ uh, SW272U, which is an amazingly good monitor in terms of color value and features. The reason I'm pointing this out at the start is not a hard sell, but everything that I'm about to explain to you hinges on you being able to actually view the files accurately. Without a color managed monitor, uh, everything that I'm about to tell you will fall down because this is the device where we make all the assessments about the color, the exposure, the density, the contrast of our files. And if that's not right, we're making changes to our files that are probably going to uh, appear differently than we expect uh, when we see them on a calibrated screen. So first and foremost, we should be working on a good color man managed screen. So I'll just go back to the other camera, uh, which is this one here. So I've um, put together a presentation, which is fairly simple. Um, but there's just some points that we need we need to follow. And I'm going to talk about some terminologies and things that hopefully will help you understand a little bit more about how a color managed workflow works. So without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen. And I will go across to my presentation. If I could find it, where are we? Here we go. And we will start. So just, just a few things about myself. I'm a, um, I've been a commercial photographer for, well, since 1986 when I opened my studio. So I'm based in Melbourne. I have, it says 35 years plus. I probably need to update this slide. It was 37 years last year. So it'll be 38 years coming June since I opened my studio. I graduated in 84 from Photography Studies College in Melbourne, which is a pho uh, photography only uh, or imaging only college based here in Melbourne, Victoria. Um, I opened my studio in 86. I was involved uh, quite heavily with the former AIPP, being state president in 98 to 99 uh, and national president on the, on the national board 2002 to 2084. I'm currently a brand ambassador for BenQ, Ilford, Profoto and XWrite. And I've got to point out that being a brand ambassador for these brands is not a case of me using this gear because of that relationship. I think these relationships stem because we actually use the gear and believe in the products that we use. So everything that I am um, pr presenting tonight, um, sorry, I should say, if you came into my studio, every monitor in my studio, and I have five of them, is a BenQ. So um, you know, I'm, I'm actually using the product that I'm presenting on tonight. So um, just some honours. I was also the chairman of compliance and a member of the honours committee. I'm a generalist commercial photographer, so I'll do anything from photographing tractors out in fields to outboard motors in the Sydney Harbour, working in foundries, hanging out of helicopter doors, interiors, people, um, and food, packaging, products, you name it. I pretty much photograph it. So... I'm what you'd call a generalist commercial photographer. So if I feel that I'm able to do the work, I will accept the job. I also do a lot of work, just personal work. So I've just put some samples of some of my personal work in here just to give you an idea of the sorts of things that that make me tick. So um, we'll start off with colour management um, at the very, the very basic. So colour management... Um, I've put I've set here the glue that binds it all together. Now I don't know if you can see everything on mine, the um the little zoom screens covering heart of it, but ICC profiles is really what holds color management together. And I'll explain ICC profiles to you um in a moment, but basically what they are, they are little files that contain all the color image, uh, color information specific to a device, media, or workspace. So they're little translators. So our cameras have them, our monitors have them. When we print, they have them. And they're little 
bits of software code essentially that tell one device what the how the other device reproduces the color so they can make a translation to keep some sort of color consistency there i'm trying to put it in in real layman's terms um if you don't understand you can sort of grill me a little bit later in question time okay so very simply put as i said they act as a translator to translate the color information from one device to another so here i have a picture of two color gamuts the outside one that you see is, which is in the wireframe is adobe rgb and the inside one which is the solid ball of color is a profile that I wrote for Ilford Gallery Textured Cotton Rag, which is a matte paper. And as you can see, one is much, much bigger than the other. So what gamut is? Gamut is the amount of color that a device is able to reproduce. So every device reproduces colors very, very differently. So as you can see, Adobe RGB, and you're going to hear that word a lot tonight, um, uh, some of you are probably already aware of it, but if you're not, I will, I will get into more detail with that down the track. But Adobe RGB is what we call an editing space, which we work in. And the other profile that you see in there is a destination space. So what profiling would do would tell uh, the printer when I'm printing on um, the Ilford Gallery Texture Cotton Rag, how to translate the color the most accurate way from this larger gamut into the smaller gamut. So there is a bit of give and take, and we'll get into that a little bit further down the track. So the first step in the process is to set your camera to the right color space. Now I will point out that this step is only if you're shooting in JPEG. If you're shooting in, um, with your camera in JPEG, it's important that you set your camera to the right color space. And I have uh, my, my little cannon here on the desk, but I've taken a screen grab of the back of the screen. We essentially have two color spaces to work with in most cameras, Adobe RGB and sRGB. I'm going to suggest for your photography that you should all set your cameras to Adobe RGB. If you become more experienced and you have a specific reason for shooting in sRGB, that's okay. But the difference between the two is a little bit like the chart that I showed you earlier, where Adobe RGB is much, much bigger than sRGB. So in order for us to get the most color out of our camera, if we're shooting in JPEG, we set it to Adobe RGB, we're capturing the largest amount of color that we can with that camera. Now down the track, I'm going to talk about converting colors, but we can make it sRGB if we have a, a need for that down the track. But if we shoot in sRGB, we can't expand it to Adobe RGB at a later stage because the way the camera works is it throws that information out if we're shooting JPEG. Now, I don't shoot JPEG. I've put this up purely for those that do. I actually work in um, a RAW format and we would export to that color space, but I'll get to that shortly. The next thing we do is we need to set up Photoshop for correct color. Now, by default, Photoshop isn't set up correctly. So to set Photoshop up, we'd need to go to edit, color settings, and this window would appear. And you would see here, I might just see if I can, if you have a look at the top window there under working spaces, it says sRGB. sRGB stands for standard RGB, and that's a smaller color space, and it's designed for the web. It's not designed for photographic prints. So we need to change that. So if we click on that drop down menu, we can select Adobe RGB there. So that's the first thing I'd suggest you do. And if you want to write this down or make note of it in Photoshop, you go to edit, color settings, and you'll see it there. And then you change it to Adobe RGB. That's the first step. So what we have now is if we're capturing JPEGs in our camera or processing our raw files in Adobe RGB, we're bringing them into an environment that's displaying Adobe RGB. So we're, we're actually uh, synchronizing the color spaces that we're working with. Very, very important. Something else I choose to do, um, and you may or may not wish to do that, I tick all these uh, check boxes, ask when opening, ask when uh, pasting, um, and missing profiles, ask when opening. Now, the reason I do that is so that Photoshop will actually tell me if there's a profile mismatch. Now, a profile mismatch can mean 
um, contaminated color, you know, not the color that you would expect. So it's really important that you know what's happening to your files when you open it. So ask when opening will tell you if you're opening an Adobe RGB file or an sRGB file rather in Adobe RGB that it's not an Adobe RGB file and you can make, make appropriate steps on how you choose to deal with it. Now, I leave the ones above it set to preserve embedded files because I might get a client that gives me a file in a different color space. Photoshop will render it correctly. I'll see it correctly and make adjustments correctly. But when I send it back to them, it will be in the color space they sent it to me. But that's probably getting a little bit complex. But ask when opening. The missing profiles we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about conversion and assigning. Sometimes uh, you'll have files where for some reason there isn't a color profile. And what will happen is missing profiles, if you've got that checked, it will say, hey, this, this photo doesn't have a profile attached. And then you can take the appropriate steps to make sure you uh, you assign a profile to that file so that you can see the colors as they should be seen. So embedding profiles, and this relates to what we spoke about earlier, by default, Photoshop will embed profiles. So if you're working in Adobe RGB in Photoshop or any other editor, because this is not Photoshop language, ICC profiles uh, right across all different types of software uh, when it comes to imaging, all right? So it's not only in Photoshop. I'm choosing to display Photoshop because it pretty much is industry standard. But when we save a file, we need to make sure that that embed color profile is ticked. The reason we do that is if we send that file to a printer or we send that file to a client, if we're, if we're you know, doing some professional work or to a lab, wherever it goes, they know exactly how you intended that color to appear because you've embedded the color profile that it was edited in with the file. If you don't embed that, um, that file, what happens is the person at the other end that's viewing that file will then have to make a guess as to how you wanted that file reproduced. And they will do that by assigning a profile, but they may assign a profile that was not the one that you worked in, which will actually change the color. Sounds quite complex, but it really isn't. I'll, I'll keep going. So when we're exporting, if we're not shooting JPEG, but we're shooting RAW, which is the format that I work in, um, I would then have no color profile assigned to the raw file, but I would assign a profile to it or embed a profile in that file upon export. And how that works, I've got two screen grabs here. I use a program like Capture One. Um, it's, it's not dissimilar to Lightroom in the way it works. Um, so I don't have Lightroom to show you, but I have shown Adobe Camera Raw, which is the same engine that Lightroom uses. And you can see there, there's both options in your export panels to select what color space that you want it to work in. So we're either capturing JPEGs with Adobe RGB set in the camera, or we're processing them out of our raw editing software with that profile tagged or, or in that profile, in that color space is probably a better way of putting it. It then is going into Photoshop to be worked on and it's being worked on in that color space. So everything marries up. So it's, it's, it's handling the color the way it should be because it's the same color space. Think of it as like a language. We're, we're putting an English file into an English working environment as opposed to taking an English file and putting it into a French working space and, the, and it just doesn't work the same way. So it's about just making sure that every, everything's on the same page. So converting profiles when do we convert to a profile and when do we assign? Very, very simply, the only time you would assign a profile is when there isn't one attached. And I'll explain why. First of all, converting profiles is what we do. So if we have a, a file that is in something other than Adobe RGB and we're working in Adobe RGB, we would get a message that comes up in Photoshop that says, hang on a minute, you know, you're working, your working space is Adobe RGB, but you've given me a file, in this case, in Color Match RGB. It's a different color space. What do you want us to do? You would convert that because what converting does 
is it maintains the color of the file, but changes the actual RGB values. And what I mean by RGB values, every single color in that file, every pixel is made up of three sets of numbers, a value from zero to 255 in red, in, from zero to 255 in green, and from zero to 255 in blue. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna change those numbers so that the color that those numbers represent in color match RGB, which is the profile in the chart on the left, change so that the color closely matches what it should be in Adobe RGB. So it's gonna change the numbers, but maintain the look of the color. For 99.9% .9 of what you do, you will always convert. And you'll have a look when I go to the next slide and look at the chart on the right, you'll see that there is a change in color. I don't know if you, I'll go backwards and forwards a couple of times. All right. That's the difference between assigning and converting. So where converting actually maintains the color, but changes the numbers to the appropriate numbers to reproduce those colors, assigning does the exact opposite. Assigning maintains the numbers. So if you've got a color that's made up of three specific numbers, it takes those numbers and puts them exactly the same way into the new color space. However, in the new color space, those three numbers may mean a slightly different color. So what we're seeing happen is the numbers are staying the same, but the color is changing. So the only time I would suggest that we look at assigning a profile is when we have a file and, and it doesn't have to be someone else's file. You might open a file that you that you worked on, you know, two years ago or a year ago. And for some reason, there wasn't a color profile embedded with it. If you tick those boxes, like I suggested uh, in, in one of the earlier slides, what will come up is a warning that says, hang on a minute, this photo doesn't have a profile. At that stage, you would assign a profile. You can't convert because you don't have a profile to convert from. Then what you would do is you'd go to the assign profile. So that's in edit, assign profile. And you would go through and you'd click on the different ones and you would pick the one that you think best suits the file. And this can be a subjective thing. There's no right or wrong here. It's the one that looks the best. Generally, you would only pick between the two and that would be sRGB or Adobe RGB. I hope that's making sense to you. So talking about, about the languages, I've created this little chart and essentially everything that we use in a digital workflow has an ICC profile. ICC stands for International Colour Consortium. It was a group of colour uh, professionals that very, very early in the piece got together to decide that there needed to be some sort of standard to maintain colour across various devices. And they come up with the system of ICC profiling. Essentially, if you have a look at this chart, the little colored cubes in the center of the arrow are ICC profiles. So our camera has a profile and it massage, massages the color that it takes. That profile is put inside the camera by the camera manufacturer. However, you can override that and write new profiles if you wish to do so. Um, but that's probably a little bit more complex than... Um, than what we're talking about here today. Scanners have profiles. A color managed monitor like the BenQ that I'm using here tonight also has a profile and so does a printer. And what it does is it maps the way those devices read the color and it makes a tweak on the fly. A lot of people think that, okay, if I buy a color managed monitor, I don't have to do anything. It's color manage, manage. That's not true. What happens with a with when we calibrate a monitor is we measure the deficiencies of that monitor and we save them in an ICC profile so that we change the signal that's being displayed on that monitor to display the color correctly. All right. So the monitor can be a little bit out. That profile will bring it into line. Okay. The difference with the BenQ monitors are they do that internally rather than at the computer. They do it on the monitor. So it's far more accurate that way. But that's essentially what an ICC profile is. Adobe RGB and sRGB, the color gamuts that we work in, are also ICC profiles. So they describe the color of the photograph that we've taken, that we've edited in Photoshop in Adobe RGB. They describe that color 
through that profile to the monitor, to the printer or whatever. And everything's mapped back to that in order to maintain color accuracy. So then the next step in the process is actually calibrating a, a monitor, all right? So when we calibrate a monitor, uh, we go through a series of steps here, and I'm not going to do it tonight. There is a, uh, a video on the BenQ page from my previous webinar where we went through all of the ins and outs of monitor profiling and calibration. So it's probably best that you watch that where you can stop it and start it and go back and, and have a look at things. But there's a couple of things that we need to take uh, into consideration, and that is that um, a monitor um, ICC, um, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought there for a moment. The ICC profile, when we create it, there's just a couple of settings that we need to be aware of in order to make sure that we are uh, setting the monitor up for photography because videographers use these, use these monitors, uh, designers, and they all work in different color spaces. So Adobe RGB is an ICC profile, but it's also what we call a color space. So it's it's a space that contains a certain amount of color that we can work with. And I'm going to go through and, and just demonstrate some of the things in Photoshop and that shortly to show you what I'm talking about. So again, I, I stress what I said earlier, if we do not have a color accurate monitor, um, everything's going to fall down because we're going to make adjustments to our files at this point in the workflow um, that are going to affect the file from here on in. And to simplify that very, very easily, if you are making adjustments, you've been away on a fantastic overseas trip and you are color correcting and making adjustments to all your files and your monitor is too bright and it's too yellow, every adjustment you make on that is going to make the file more blue to try and get rid of the yellow and too dark to compensate for the bright monitor. So I hope you understand that. The monitor's too bright. We're going to make our file darker. So when you give it to someone whose monitor isn't too bright and is viewing correctly, the photo is going to be too dark because you've adjusted the photo to compensate for your monitor. It's also going to be too blue on their monitor, which is, which is set up correctly because your monitor is too yellow. I'm talking hypothetically here, of course. Your monitor is too yellow, so you are taking the yellow out of it, which is making the file more blue. You give it to someone who's got a color accurate monitor, and bang, there you go. Your photo's too dark and too blue. So it's really important that if you don't do anything else in a color managed work workflow, you at least look at using a color uh, calibrated monitor or a color accurate monitor so that so that you see this is where we make all our assessments there's nothing else we view them on other than prints but we make those assessments on how we're going to print it on a monitor so if it's wrong here it's going to be wrong in the print so moving so the tools that i use for calibrating are tools like this i1 display here I've got one here on the desk as well. The important thing, and this is in the video um, on the BenQ page where, um, where we go into it in a little bit more depth using the BenQ um, Palette Master Ultimate, which is the software that comes with these monitors, but it explains the settings that you need to consider when you're displaying. And I'll just put them up there and I'll explain to you what they mean. So the white balance means the color of the white, okay? So it's measured in degrees Kelvin. So D65 or 6,500 degrees Kelvin is the color temperature that is standard in photography. So the graphic design industry, for argument's sake, may use 5,000 degrees Kelvin. They're working in a whole different workspace. In photography, that gives us neutral whites and fairly... Um, neutral colors. So that is our color space, D65. So these settings, irrespective of what you're calibrating your monitor with, whether it's a BenQ, whether it's a Dell, whether it's something else, these settings are exactly the same. All right. So whatever device you're using, this would apply to. Gamma should be at 2.2. Gamma is where the gray sits, the mid, mid gray within the file. All right. Because that can move up or down. There's really only two um, standards in here, but that would be the one for photography. That's a gamma of 2.2. 2. 
pretty much these are the three things that you're going to be asked to set manually when you calibrate a monitor using a device. So D65 or 6,500 degrees Kelvin, gamma of 2.2. Now the last one's quite tricky and that's the luminance. Luminance just means brightness. And you'll see there that I have a range, 80 to 100 candela per square meter. It's just a measurement of, of, um, of brightness. Okay. The reason I can't give you an accurate figure on what to set there is because it really depends on so many other variables. So if you have your monitor set up in a room that's fairly bright, um, it would need to be uh, set at a, at a brighter setting than if you're in a darker room. And I'll give you an example. Everyone's got a mobile phone. If you're on the beach in the midday sun, that screen actually looks pretty dark when you look at it, right? So someone, you know, sends you a photo and you try and look at it in the dark and you can't see it, right? But they send you that same photo in the middle of the night when you've been lying in bed in a dark room and you pick the phone up and look at it and it's way too bright. The phone hasn't actually changed. What's changed is the environment in which you're viewing it. So when we're setting our monitors up for luminance, this is something that we need to consider. So the first thing we need to consider is that the bright uh, that the room shouldn't have a level of brightness that's changing throughout the day. So you need to try and keep it consistent. Now, this is only when you're doing color accurate work and you're trying to control density. Excuse me. So my suggestion would be if you've got a reasonably lit room um, during the day, but the sun's coming in through a window and it's changing, it's going to change the way that you see the photographs on that screen. So an option for working on images when you're adjusting the color and the brightness might be to close a curtain and put on a light so that you can maintain that level of luminance within the room throughout an entire day. Something to consider. I have an office upstairs which has uh, floor to ceiling windows and it's quite bright during the day. Um, fortunately, it never gets the sun. So the actual luminance in the room doesn't change so much when I've got the LED lights on in the, in the roof. But it's significantly brighter than down here in the studio. So down here in the studio, I, I calibrate my monitors to 80 candela, whereas in my office upstairs, I calibrate them to 100. Now, if you're in a really super bright environment, you may even have to go brighter. The way that you can tell is if you're going to, if you're printing photographs in a color managed workflow and they're coming out too dark, like I said earlier, that means your monitor's too bright. So you'd need to come back and calibrate it a little bit darker. So some, calibrate it till the image on the screen resembles the brightness of the image on the paper that you've had printed. Equally, if your prints are coming out too bright, it means that your screen's too dark. And that, you know, would need to be recalibrated and brightened up a little bit again till it resembles that print that you've got that's too dark because that's your reference point. Only in terms of brightness, not colour, just brightness. And that would be the candela setting. So very, very simple. What we're doing, if our screen's too dark, we're making our print brighter to compensate for the dark screen when we should be making our screen brighter and vice versa. I hope that makes sense. Uh, if not, it'll, it will be question times like a question time later. Okay. So monitor viewing conditions, I touched on that very, very briefly just then, but the environment that we need to consider, I'll go through here quickly. Whoop. That's it. Things that we need to consider is the room lighting. The room lighting and lighting consistency um, should be such that it's not shining on our screen. Uh, you'll see the BenQ on the screen there. It's the previous model, but it has a viewing hood. That's to stop light coming from a, from a light source to the side or through a window and actually polluting what we're seeing on the screen. So we need to make sure that the room lighting is suitable for viewing. And that is generally not really, really bright, but not pitch dark either, all right? If you have a room that has really, really bright lighting, it might be worth closing the curtains and just having a desk lamp on somewhere in the room to raise the overall luminance a little bit, as long as it's not reflecting in the screen. Light consistency means that we really just need it to be consistent throughout the day. It's no point having a, an editing suite set up 
next to a window where it's, you know, twice as bright in the morning as it is in the afternoon, or we have a really sunny day and it's really bright and all of a sudden the clouds come over and the whole room goes dark, because that in turn will affect the way that we see photos and see our images on the screen. Room colour can have an effect. If we've got a room, you know, I was married back in the 80s and apricot was a really fashionable colour and then we had our house painted in apricot. I hate to think about it now, but if I had my monitor set up against an apricot wall, that apricot colour would be uh, affecting the way I see the image. Colour of clothing. It's best to, to wear neutral colour when we are editing photographs, uh, black or white or grey, because those colours can reflect into the screen and give us a false opinion of what's happening with the colour. The last one I've got there is, I was going to say fatigue, but fatigue. Uh, fatigue is really important. Uh, I don't know how many of you have done what I regularly do when I try to burn the candle at both ends is I stay back late and edit a whole lot of files only to come back in the morning and think, I've just wasted my time. I should have gone home, had some sleep, come back and edit them with fresh eyes because fatigue will have an effect on how we see them. So don't, you know, if you're really tired at the end of the day, don't go to edit, you know, critical colour stuff because it will have an effect. It will have an effect on the way we see things. I've heard things recently that even things like coffee change the way we see things. To what degree, I don't know. But they're all things that we need to consider. The reason being is a thing called colour constancy. And the way the human brain works is it tells us what we think what it thinks we're seeing, not necessarily what we're actually seeing. And this is just a slide that I downloaded from the web to give you an idea. So we've got a, you know, like a black and white draft board type arrangement there. And in two of the, of the squares, we have a round yellow circle. Now, if you look at the circle at the top, it appears to be much darker than the circle at the bottom. If we look at the square that the circle at the bottom's on, it's a white square. We can quite clearly see that it's white and it looks much brighter than the gray square at the top where the other circle is in. But in actual fact, they are exactly the same color. What happens is color constancy tells us that it should be white because it looks at all the white squares around it. And our brain says, well, that's white because of the pattern and the repeating texture and our brain makes corrections for us. And this can be a real issue if you've got um, two images that are identical and you're trying to make adjustments. Uh, you know, there might be uh, two takes of the same shoot. You might've taken a, a portrait of your partner and you've got them side by side trying to match the color. And if one side of the frame is brighter than the other side, when you put them up on the screen, the brighter side of one is going to be against the darker side of the other, and it's going to make one of those look darker than the other. If you swap them around, it's not going to it's going to change which one looks lighter and which one looks darker because color constancy is affecting the way we're viewing them. So with all of the uh, technology we have in place for managing and controlling color, there still is a subjective element. And that subjective element is affected by color constancy. So we need to make sure that we that we address this by, you know, making sure we're not wearing, you know, bright Hawaiian shirts when we're doing color critical work. To make sure that we uh, aren't doing color critical critical work after being out at a party all night, because that's going to affect the way that we see them. So they're just common common sense things. So I'll push on. So we also. Um, if, if any of you are uh, looking at printing your own work, um, use a similar device to the device that we calibrate the screens with. And I'll go through these devices uh, once I've finished this slideshow. Um, we can also write profiles for printers really, really simply. And this device that I've got on the screen does the screen, but it also it's a little bit more expensive than a device that just does uh, screens, but this one will also allow you to calibrate printers. And it works the same way. Every time we calibrate and profile a device, we're measuring known color values that have been sent to that device. And then we measure how those colors have varied on what we expect to see. And then the profile will create a tweak or a bit of an adjustment to bring it back in line. That's essentially how profiling works. It's not, it's not rocket science. I do, um, I copy fine art. 
and we would we would place a chart in the frame where we know the color values and we would write a profile for that scene and it's amazing how all of a sudden colors will pop out of a painting that we couldn't see earlier once we've profiled it and we get that color balance right so it doesn't have to be difficult and i'll go over it very very quickly in point form in a moment this is just a more expensive type of um, device for, for creating printer profiles so this device is made by a company called x -Rite, and x -Rite have been involved in the back end color management of uh, the BenQ monitors. So what, what um, BenQ are presenting to us as a color managed monitor has been taken care of by one of the largest color management companies in the world. So it's, it is real quality we're looking at. So if we are printing, we really need to make assessments on what we've printed in controlled lighting. If we've got a controlled monitor and we've got a controlled, um, and we've got our camera control, but we're set to Adobe RGB and everything's looking right, we need to assess our prints the same way. And it's only a little thing, but I have been to write profiles for people and they've said to me, my prints are coming out too dark. And I'll go out and I'll have a look at the site and I'll have a look and they've got a, they're looking at their images on a bright monitor in a dark room. They're printing in a dark room and then looking at their prints in the dark. Of course, the print's going to look too dark. It's, it, it goes without saying, you need to view that print in correct lighting. Now, most of us can just take it outside and look at it in, in daylight and say, okay, yeah, it's bright enough. The colors are right and so forth. It's not the most accurate way. If you want to take it to the next step, you could get something like one of these GTI viewing boxes or um, Ilford actually make a little a little desk lamp. It's about $140 that, that you can have next to your computer to put prints under to check that they're coming out as they should be. But that's, that's further down the track um, when you are printing. Last points I would like to make. Um, is that we will never match our screens 100%. Okay, there is always going to be a variation and that variation comes down to color gamuts. All right, so when I showed you the color gamut uh, step earlier on in the, in, the, in the presentation, we saw Adobe RGB was quite big and the profile for the paper that I was using in that, uh, in that slide, which was Ilford Texture Cotton Rag, was quite small. So we somehow have to shrink the color from this big gamut into something that's not able to reproduce as much color. And the only way we can do that accurately is with an ICC profile because it will measure where the closest place within that gamut is for the color to be shifted to. But it does mean it's never going to be 100% the same. The other thing we need to consider is if we're printing we're looking at our images on a screen that has a D65 pure white base. But when we print to paper, some of those papers have a warmer base. Some of them have a bluey colored base. And that again will change how the file looks in our highlights and shadows. This isn't a problem. This just becomes part of the creative process and it helps you have more choices and, and gives you the opportunity to make decisions on what paper to print on to get the best out of that file and to reflect the mood and the feeling that you were liking, uh, wanting to produce with that image. That is the end of that presentation. I'll just go through, um, I'll stop. And I'll just go through. So I talked about a few things um, in, in that uh, session. So the first one I talked about was our color settings. So I'm gonna just show you on the screen here. Um, if where you would find that, I'll put a little ring around my cursor so you can see where I'm traveling. So if any of you wanted to take notes at this point, so assuming that we have um, set our, our camera up to Adobe RGB when we're working, um, if we're shooting JPEG, and assuming that we are exporting our files from our raw processor into Adobe RGB, we would then set Photoshop up into RG, Adobe RGB. So what I have here is a file, I don't know if you can see at the bottom there, its color space is called Color Match RGB. I'm gonna do a convert and a 
a sign very shortly. But first thing we're going to do is we're going to change the color settings. A lot of people don't realize that in the back end, you need to actually set Photoshop up. It doesn't come out of the box with the color settings set the way that we need them because everyone needs different things from this software. As photographers, I'm recommending Adobe RGB because it is the most color we can get out of our camera in a JPEG form. We can get more color out of it if we're processing um, the raw file. However, there's no device that can that can print that much color. There's no screen that can display that much color. You'll see the, the BenQ screens, they, they promote the fact that they're 100% of sRGB and 99% of Adobe RGB. That means we can see the color on this device that's being produced. So that's why I recommend Adobe RGB. You may have a specific reason for using another color space. If you're a web designer, for argument's sake, you may want to simplify it and just work in sRGB. That's fine. Then everywhere I've told you put Adobe RGB, you just put sRGB. My thought process behind that, however, is that if I've got more color as a photographer and someone needs images for the web, I can very easily do an action to give them a set that are converted to sRGB. Um, some websites will convert them on the fly if, you, if you're putting them into a web gallery and so forth. But first things first, we'll set uh, Photoshop up. To do that, we would go up here to edit and we'd click on that and down the bottom, you will see color settings. And if I click on that, there is a drop down menu here. And by default, you will see when you get into yours that it's set to sRGB. I would like you to change that to Adobe RGB. Oops, to Adobe RGB. And my suggestion is to tick these. Now, some people find that annoying. There's no, there's no um, right or wrong here. I do it because I like to be informed. If you find it's annoying to have these messages coming up, then, then turn these off. But be aware you won't be made aware of profile mismatches and things. If you have a workflow where you're following what I said, you're not going to get any messages coming up at all, um, but only in the event if there is a profile mismatch. So it's a good it's a good safety net. This is where we would set up. So I'll go, I'll show you that again. That's edit, color settings, Adobe RGB. That's what we would set up. The next thing I will show you is we talked about converting. Now this is, we can see that I've got down the bottom here, if you can't see this on yours, you can choose what you want displayed. At the moment, I've got document profile. So this profile is just a PDI reference chart, or this one's a CTI target, which has industry standard color charts in us for, it, for us to look at. It's currently in color match RGB. So if I go here and I go edit, assign, I'm going to suggest that, that this is what you would do if you had a photograph that didn't have a profile embedded and you opened it up and it said missing profile. I would open it up. I would go edit, assign, and I would click on profile. And then what I would do is I would make with the preview clicked, I would just go through and have a look at which profile is actually giving us the best result or the desired result. It becomes a, su a subjective process at this case. But you can see that changing from, if I turn preview on and off, if I, if I assign sRGB to this, there's quite a significant change, all right? Because what I'm doing is I'm taking the numbers that represent colors in, S in color match RGB, and I'm just transposing those numbers into sRGB without any regard for what it's doing to the color. So the color's gonna change. So this is how we assign, but only do this if there is no profile embedded and then pick the one that you think's best. So I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to do the same thing and they're all under edit. So edit, we've got our color settings, we've got assign profile and we've got convert. Convert is what I think that you would use more often. And if I click on convert, we get a similar window that comes up and you'll see here it's showing the profile that's in it, it's putting the, the same destination space up for some reason. But if I pick sRGB and I click the preview on and off, you'll see there's very little change in the file. You probably can't see it on your screen. 
But there is some very, very subtle changes happening here. If I go to Adobe RGB, there will probably be no change because Adobe RGB is a larger gamut and it can ac accommodate all the color in that file. So when we want to change from one file to another, that's how we would do it. So if we wanted to maintain the color of a file that we had in Adobe RGB and make a copy for the web, we would simply open up a du duplicate copy. We would go edit, convert to profile, change it because it's in Adobe RGB now because I just converted it. And we would convert it to the desired profile, which for the web would be sRGB. And if you have a look now, there's virtually no change in color. Sounds really long-winded, and I don't know the level um, that you guys are at because I have no idea who's watching on the other end. But what I want you to understand is that, that converting to profile will maintain the color. Assigning profile, we only do that if there isn't a profile with the file, and we need to, we need to assign one to make sure that it's going to reproduce color the way we expect and to bring it into a color managed workflow. I hope that makes sense. The other thing I will do is I will just bring up Capture One. And I'm just gonna check, did I, I had a file here. Have I deleted it? With a bit of luck, it's still here. Yeah, here we go. I'll put it back on the screen. I'm going to show you this file. So I use Capture One. Um, it's my preferred workflow. But if you see this here, I'm not going to do any correction to it. Uh, this is a job I did on Monday. I tell the software how I want that file reproduced. So I would set this up and I would set that to Adobe RGB so that when I process that file, I'll, quick, I'll quickly process that one out and get it to open in Photoshop. Uh, what am I doing? Uh, sorry. So make sure it's there. So it'll open in Photoshop. Here we have it in Photoshop. And if I look down the bottom here, it's in Adobe RGB. So this is how I would do it. If I wanted to, if I go back to Capture One, if I wanted a JPEG of that, um, and I wanted it in full resolution, but I wanted it in, in sRGB, I would just change the output profile to sRGB, which should be, why is it not there? Showing all the profiles, where's sRGB? There we go, sRGB. So if I now turn that off and I export a JPEG, I'll get it to open in Photoshop so we don't have to go looking for it. Uh, open with Photoshop, export. I now have a version. And can you see how it's telling me that I have a profile mismatch? Because my workflow is set up in sRGB, uh, in Adobe RGB, but I've just sent a prof uh, an image to it that's in sRGB. It's not a problem. I can make a decision at this point how I want to proceed with it. Because this is going for the web, I'm just going to use the embedded profile instead of the working space. I'm not going to change it. If I wanted to change it, I could convert on the fly and it will do exactly the same as what it did up there where, it, where I converted and it will convert it and it will end up being an Adobe RGB file but I'm going to use the embedded profile instead. And you'll see down the bottom here, we have sRGB. It's just a narrower color gamut. Now I'm going to shut these down and I have the raw file on my desktop here, which I'm just going to open up with Photoshop um, because I want to open that in a camera raw. I'm going to suggest that most of you are probably, what's it doing? most of you are Lightroom or Photoshop users. So this has got no corrections applied and it opens up differently than what it does in um, Capture One. But in Adobe Camera Raw, down the bottom here is this little line. And this little line is where our settings are on how we're going to output it. So if I click on that, 
it will open up a window and here I can choose what color space I want to output it as. So if I'm processing a raw file, I want it to be Adobe RGB, I'd set that to Adobe RGB and I'd go OK. I'd go open and there we are, it's in Adobe RGB. All right. They're the two most the two most common ones. And it's look, it depends on what you want to do with your files. If you want to get the most color out of them for printing and so forth, Adobe RGB is the way to go. But that said, I know lots of professional photographers that do weddings and so forth and work in sRGB. The most important thing is that you keep it consistent. You set your camera up, you export from your raw application, and you have your Photoshop set up to all be working in the same color space. That's how we maintain color across a um, across the whole workflow. I hope that hasn't confused people too much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll go back to a camera. Uh, here we go. So can you see me, Aditya? Yes, I can, Ian. Okay. That's basically it. Now, I hope that wasn't too confusing. We haven't lost everyone. Um, no, we have 38 participants as of now. So, yeah, pretty consistent. Oh, good. So that's it for the for the presentation. I'm... I'm um, Going to open it up to questions now. If if anyone has any any questions, so we have received three questions as of now. Ian, one is uh, by Scott. In regards to soft proofing, do you always use Photoshop to soft proof, or can this be done in Lightroom or in my case, Capture One? Uh, in Capture One, it can be done with soft proofing. There, if you go, there is a um, a proofing tab and it's not there by default, but if in capture one, you go to, um, so, so it depends on what you call soft proofing. All right. So there's, there's two forms of soft proofing. So in capture one, it will give you a proof of the process recipe, the way you're processing it out. So it will show if you're, if you're processing it out in a certain color space, you can actually click on the, on the proof. Uh, it's not there by default in the menu. If you right click, on the top bar and you go customize, you'll see a little pair of glasses in, in the in the button. You drag that button up onto the onto the task bar and that's the proofing button. If you switch that on, it will preview or give you a proof of how that file is going to be processed out. So it's a soft proof of the processing uh, side of things, okay? So um, if you, for argument's sake, had a recipe that, that had a black and white conversion uh, built into it, if you hit the soft proof, it would show you the black and white copy. If you turn the soft proof off, it would go back to the color. That's in Capture One. I don't use Capture One for soft proofing for printing. Uh, I use Photoshop for that. And I do that through the view custom proof. And then you need to embed the profile of the media and the printer that you're printing to. So I use Canon printers here. So if I was printing to keep it consistent on Ilford textured cotton rag, I'd go to the view, um, custom view, and then I'd find the profile for that printer and I would display that and it would show me what's going to happen to my color. And then what I would do is I'd make a decision on which rendering intent I'd print with. And that's probably getting a little bit more complex, but, but rendering intent is what's going to determine how the color is mapped from the file in Adobe RGB to the color gamut of the printer. And there's really only two we'd look at, and that's perceptual colorimetric or relative colorimetric. And generally, there is no right or wrong. You choose the one that makes the print look the best because it's 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 moving the color based on the file, not on any other algorithm. So they're, they're the two ways that I would do it. Sure. So the next question that we have is from Joe. Uh, the question is, uh, could you please talk us through bit mode or is 8 or 16 bit best? 16 bits always better. Um, so the way uh, bit technology works or everything on a computer is based on bit depth uh, or bit technology. Now, if we are shooting uh, JPEG, then we don't have the option of shooting 16 bit. If we're shooting raw, we have the option of, of shooting in 16 bit. And that just gives us a lot more information to work with. And if I can put it quite simply, um, every time we add a bit, we double the amount of information. So 8-bit, we go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 
64, 128, 256. So this is where we get our 256 levels of tone. This is when we look at a histogram and we've got from zero to 255. That's it, 255 levels in red, green, and blue in an 8-bit file. Now, what that, what that means is if our file is underexposed and it's a processed file, not a raw file, whenever we make an adjustment, we're actually throwing away information. So instead of 256 levels of tone, if we're one stop underexposed and we bring our levels down, we're disregarding everything um, to the right side of that, of that slider and only keeping what's on the left and resampling it, we've thrown away half our information. So what that means is an 8-bit file underexposed by a stop fixed in levels is now only got 128 levels of tone because we've thrown half of the information away. In 16-bit, we add, we double, we keep doubling. So instead of 256, we then go to 512, uh, 1024, 2049 and so forth up to, uh, I can't remember if it's 16,000 or 60,000. So we've got a lot more data to play with when we're making adjustments. And where you'll see that is if you've got a graduated sky for argument's sake and you've done some work on it and all of a sudden you start to see banding appear where you don't get a nice graduated even tone, you start to get solid lines where the tonal range changes. That's because we've worked the file to the point where there's no more information for it to resample to give us a smooth transition. Whereas if we're in 16 bit, it would it would stay smooth all the way. So 16 bit all the way for editing. Once you've finished with that file, you don't have to save it in 16 bit if you're trying to save space. I do, I save my working files in 16 bit, but if you're struggling for space, if you're finished with it and you think you don't want to do any more to it, you can then save it as 8 bit because then it's going to give you a file that has the full 256 levels of tone unadulterated without anything lost. Awesome. Uh, so the next question we have is from Levin. Um, if I have a camera profile example, color checker camera calibration ICC profile, how do I incorporate that into this process? Uh, so if you do that, you'd need to go to um, the Calibrite, uh, just do a Google search for Calibrite camera calibration software. The way you would do that is you'd photograph that chart into in in one of the frames and then you'd bring that chart into um into this camera calibration software and it will automatically detect the patches and create a profile you would then bring that into your workflow now capture one and lightroom work in two different ways so capture one uses an icc profile method uh, lightroom uses a dng method and in the calib camera calibration software down the bottom where it says help, if you click on that, it'll take you through to videos and step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. I personally wouldn't do it unless, um, unless you have a really valid reason for doing it. And what I mean by that is I do use that that stuff. I I have a uh, I have a series of color checker charts here, but I have I have the 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 you know the one with uh, I think it's 140 color patches. I use this process all the time, but where I use it is when what I'm photographing needs to be photographed objectively and not subjectively. So I'll photograph a scene with my Canon or my phase one camera. I'll bring it into capture one. I will choose the, um, the profile that's, in, that, that's included with the camera and the, and the contrast curve that's in, and I'll make a subjective decision. And the color will be pretty accurate once I've white balanced it. But if you came to me with a piece of artwork and I had to reproduce that absolutely 100% accurately, you know, in an, an objective way rather than subjective, I would put one of those charts in it and create a profile and use it in that fashion. I don't use it for all of my work. What I found is that you'll be disappointed if you, your day-to-day -day photography, if you start profiling the camera yourself. These camera companies, you've heard the term color science. They go to great lengths to try and get the best color out of their cameras. Um, best color is not always accurate color. In the days of film, we would shoot, we're shooting landscapes, we'd shoot it on Velvia, Fuji Velvia, because it was really nice to greens and reds. If we wanted color accuracy, we'd shoot on, on, on a Kodachrome film um, for color accuracy. So we would pick the different films. These curves are just like that. So I would only go to writing profiles when color accuracy is is the absolute pinnacle of what you're requiring. 
So thank you for that, Ian. The next question we have is from Scott. Would you ever use export ICC profile for a specific paper in Capture One? If you know, if you uh, in brackets, if you know the paper uh, you're printing on. And could, sorry, could you read that again? Would I export it with the profile embedded? Yep. So, uh, would you ever use export ICC profile for a specific paper in Capture One? No, no, no. So I I would never ever change the profile of the file that I'm printing to the to the print profile because I'm going to be throwing away all this color. There are some commercial labs that may ask you to do that, but that's actually, I, I run a, uh, a, a printing business here as well. I have large format printers and I would never ask my customers to embed my profiles into their files. I would say, send it to me in Adobe RGB, sRGB, Pro Photo RGB, I don't care. I will convert it on the fly to the paper I'm looking at. I do, however, send the profiles out to people if they want to do soft profiling, uh, soft profiling. But I would never export with that profile embedded. No. Awesome. So these are all the questions that we had. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, you're more than welcome to send those through. Uh, if not, I think we would need to conclude the webinar there then. Uh, but happy to wait for people to send across their questions. So while you're waiting, I'll just I'll just wind up and say, look, color management's quite often seen as something that's really complex and a, a really dry subject. A lot of people shy away from it. It's not a it's not a popular subject, but it will make the world of difference to your photography. I I got into digital photography at a time when the cameras had to be profiled or you couldn't get a decent result out of them. And I found it a struggle at the start because everything had to be profiled along the way. But it wasn't till I bought my first large format printer about 15 years ago um, and and realized that for the first time in my career, I now had full control over the color that I was getting in my files. Whereas prior to that, I'd send it out and I'd be relying on other people to make an assessment on the color. And, and color management now, I can't imagine um, having a workflow without it. And it's, it's just about crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Make sure that you understand what those profiles are doing. And I've presented the things that are probably a bit simple and they sound a little bit uh, complex to some of you. But at the end of the day, it's about making sure that you are working in the profile that you have embedded in your file and that you know what embedding and converting do. And I'll tell you a little anecdote. I was working with a professional photographer on a workshop and we had someone at the, um, at the workshop that had, was entering um, some photography awards and they gave me some files uh, to print. And then they went off and worked on their, on their files to send off to the awards. And I printed the files and then they, I came back and I said, they've changed. And they said, yeah, I know. We, we were told to assign um, this profile to, to our files before we send them off. So, you know, even people that are running competitions sometimes don't under, understand what's going on. So what that person had actually done was totally change the color of her files because she was told to assign it. Whereas if you understand that that's the wrong thing to do, you really only ever want to convert. Assigning is always going to change the color. If you remember that, you've, you're halfway there. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Ian. We don't have any further questions, but uh, a big thank you from BenQ team and specifically from Martin for joining us today and uh, going through this workshop and webinar. Uh, and thank you everyone who joined today. We will be, uh, this this session is recorded and you can rewatch it. We will shortly send you a rewatch link uh, and there will be a short survey after this, uh, after you end the call. Please take your time to go through it. Thank you so much once again. Thanks for watching guys. Bye. Thanks Aditya. Thank you Ian. Thank you. Good night. Okay.